So what are we starting? A YouTube comment. A no, we just. Is, is, is it actually that? No, I was. I just didn't expect that. So a fast. review. No. Uh, Patreon. A... Oh, Patreon, Patreon! Of course, it's a Patreon episode. Yes, thank you to our patrons. Thank you, you thank little you. patrons, for uh, keeping this show going. Look at that. We've got a brand new light in the background. <gasps> All for you. Thanks to the patrons. Thanks to you. You paid for it. And before we start the show, I want to ask everyone a question. Everyone that's watching, everyone that's listening, have you ever hallucinated before? Get down to the comments and let us know. Let us know down below. Start the show. Hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jeff and Luke Gutford. Hello. Hello there. This week, we're talking about Tetris and exploding heads. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. What? Isn't there an exploding head in your film? There is. There no. is an exploding <laughs> head in my film. Is there any Tetris? No Tetris. No Tetris. Could you, get, you could get the rights for Tetris for the film, surely? I haven't got any money left, Corey. Uh. <laughs> 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 I feel like Tetris must be out of copyright by now. Surely. It's no. got to be. There's, there's, the because, game. The, the idea there's for no the game way. is so simple that you can't, you, you, there's no way you can copyright that because there's been loads of Tetris like knockoffs and in other the, games. The theme, soon, the theme song is just some Russian like folk song. Yeah. Really? Yeah, super Russian. We did it in music. Anyway, you know the Tetris theme tune. And we can't get copyright striked because. Chuck it in there, go on. I know, Vladimir Putin might come for us. Oh. He can be a guest. Avid fan of the show, yeah. Featuring Vladimir Putin. That would be fucking headlines, wouldn't it? That would be quite the title. (laughs) So, do you know what we're talking about today? Any idea? Not Luke's film, I can tell you that. Well, why not? Maybe Luke's film, actually. So we're talking today about a very specific kind of hallucination. Oh. Okay. Is it where you, like, imagine Tetris blocks everywhere? And they fall on your head and your head explodes. No. Maybe... Kind of. Was I close? We'll get, no. Okay. Isn't no. You were like hallucinating like te- um like patterns that uh link together. Well, kind of. We'll get there. We'll okay. get there. This is all the way at the end. I've 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 left a little seed here. It's, it's gonna grow tease. throughout the episode. And we're gonna take the fruit at the end and we're gonna eat it. It's gonna be very sweet. We're gonna enjoy it. I liked the lemons last time. Get more fruit on the show, please. Thank you. <laughs> We've already got a fruit on the show and to be honest. <laughs> I did not come here to be insulted. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> I know what I'm getting into every week. <laughs> so, what is a hallucination? Do you guys know what a hallucination is? is when your brain's being funny and it's and it makes up things that aren't there. So well, you, that might, could, you, yeah. you might see them, you might hear them, you might smell them. Yeah, that's pretty solid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, a hallucination um, it can be brought on by l- lots of different things. You know, what can bring on a hallucination. Uh, sleep. Stuff. Yeah. No um, water. I was going to yeah. say drugs. Yeah. Drugs. Yeah. Also, uh, if uh, a surgeon is cutting into your brain, doing with it, oh. you can have a hallucination then. Lots of things. Really? Cause yeah. in your eyes? Is that a hallucination? Not really. Oh. I don't think so. Okay. No. Um, epilepsy, you could cause, uh, could cause a hallucination. Um, different kinds of mental illness, like schizophrenia. That's mm. well known for the hallucinations that it causes. Um, but also, you can have a hallucination without any of those things. I mean, well, not without sleep. Well, actually, not having sleep can cause a hallucination. Mm. But what I'm talking about today... And so can sleeping. Yes, that's what I'm talking about today. Uh, oh. Dreams. Well, not dreams. No, 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 no. The uh, hallucination whilst falling asleep and whilst oh. waking up. So let's read through what the NHS has to say about hallucinations. So <gasps> I've had this exact thing. It's so oh, freaky. fantastic. Yeah, I've had this exact thing where um, I had this very distinct memory about half a year ago of my being at my granny's house. And I woke up and it felt like my brain was still in... Um, basically a hallucination state of a dream, but I was awake and it was incredibly scary. It was absolutely horrible. I thought that like something was in the room with me. I thought that like something was just outside the window. Ooh. I thought the curtains were like moving and changing shape. It was Ooh. freaky. Did it come along so, with sleep paralysis? Um, that wasn't with sleep paralysis. Uh, mm. Well, I didn't get out of bed. I didn't necessarily try. I did sort of just lie there going, what the flip is going on? So maybe. <laughs> so is it like sleep paralysis, but without the paralysis? Well, just you can like, have the sleep paralysis. It's more just yeah. the, it, I mean, the falling asleep is, it, it's really just the hallucination that we're talking about. Right, okay. It can have sleep paralysis when you're waking up, okay. but also it also cannot, right? So let's just go through what the NHS says about, the NHS, the NHS says about hallucinations. It's a tough one. Mm. 
Mm. We'll get there. So the NHS says that hallucinations are where someone sees, hears, smells, tastes, or feels things that don't exist outside their mind. Look, stop hallucinating. What? You just you just felt something that exists only in only inside of your mind. Don't do this to me. <laughs> I've already been here. <laughs> Jamp, I'm sorry. Jamp exists. I get it. Definitely. Look. Oh, you changed See? it on. Th- <laughs> 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 For the again? listeners, um, Jamp is live cutting the show. Cameras. Well, now and... Corey gets the credit. So. Ah, yes. I'm puppeteering Jamp, and uh, Corey's tapped. Well, you have been the whole time. In the, the credits, camera. can you put me as a puppeteer, please? Thank I, you. I will. We don't do credits, but I'll start. I'll start doing credits. <laughs> start doing <them. laughs> every week. So. Um, yeah, so there are common people with schizophrenia usually experiences hearing voices, and it's interesting because it says uh, that they could be frightening, but they're usually they usually have an identifiable cause, and um, it says to see your GP straight away if you're experiencing hallucinations, um, because there's different treatment options and all all of, all of that sort of stuff. Um, really, what's interesting is that it says see your GP if you experience hallucinations, but you don't necessarily need to see your GP if you experience hallucinations. Because lots of different people, lots of people experience hallucinations mm. for basically a kind of unknown reason. There's not much that can be done about it. I'm not saying don't go see your GP. I'm not saying don't listen to the NHS. I'm just saying that some hallucinations are perfectly normal yeah. things to experience. I have a question about this because yesterday, for the first time in a long time, I was listening to pop radio station. And um, that was a very interesting experience for me. But one of the lyrics was, um, my friends tell me not to listen to the voices in my head, essentially. Mm-hmm. And I guess it was talking about like, you know, this thing. We've talked about this a lot. Some people have like an internal monologue going and going and going. I don't personally have one of these, but you guys do. Jamp doesn't. Some, I, not really. I have like things that pop into my head sometimes, but it's not like a monologue. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of like yeah. how I have. I have now, sometimes. Yeah. Now, what I find very interesting is it's totally normal to supposedly it's totally normal to hear a voice in your head all the time. And that is different to hearing voices um, that are like talking to you and telling you to do things. Now, but but the, even the standard hearing a voice in your head that's like your self that's chatting away in your head, that is a hallucination, no? Well, yes. Well, it's, see, it's something that exists inside of your mind. But I think hearing the voice in your head, it's not like hearing it. It's just you know it's in your head. Oh so no, for, people! I've I've heard, I know people who've told me that their internal monologue is like they're hearing it like an audible sound. I have never heard anyone say that. So I guess that would be some kind of hallucination, then I suppose. But I, I guess because it because it's not coming from outside of the self. Do you know what I mean? And you know As it's in, not coming. You from know, outside yeah, of the, you're yeah. you're fully aware that it is the self that is mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. Because it, it like it's like sort of closing your eyes and trying to picture something. It's not necessarily hallucinating because. You're you can, fully aw- you can control it as well in a sense. Yeah, you can control it. it you're aware that it's sort of um, it's coming from inside your head, and it, it's not like it's being experienced from outside the self and coming in through like it, it's not like it's being sensed from outside the self. Do you know what I mean? Or being projected as if it's sensed from outside the self. Yeah, exactly. Like you can hear your own voice um, both inside yourself and outside yourself, like sort of through your ears, mm. right? Mm. But it's still sort of you still know it's coming from yourself. So I guess if you're sort of if it feels like you're hearing your own inner monologue in the same way that you'd hear another voice, I guess it could be something to do with that. Although I really, honestly, I don't know. That is interesting, though. Yeah. 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 So moving on really quick. Um, have, you, have you guys heard of hypnagogic and uh, hypnopompic hallucinations? No, but I love them already. Yeah, right. I've great heard names. of hypnagogic, but I can't remember what it sta- what it means. Hypnagogic, really? Yeah, I've heard it as hypnagogic. Hypnagogic. I heard hypnagogic. Cool. Oh. Well, we'll say hypnagogic. You can say hypnagogic, and we people can in the comments, everyone. Yeah. Well, people in the comments can correct both of us. That's pretty logical. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, you. <laughs> 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 Do Joe on. So, um, hypnagogic hallucinations and hypnopompic hallucinations. Essentially, those are the, the hallucinations that happen as you're falling asleep and as you're waking up. So hypnagogic hallucinations happen as you're falling asleep and hypnopompic hallucinations happen as you're waking from sleep. Mm. So they both happen in the transitional state. I'll mm. say it again, hypnagogic is falling asleep, hypnopompic is waking up. Mm. Yeah? Do you yeah. know the etymology of these words? I do know the etymology of these words. Please. I'm very glad that you it. asked that. So they come from, I think, Greek. So 
they were first described by I'll just tell you the history of them first. So they were first described by a French psych a French psychiatrist, um, and he called them psychosensory hallucinations. Uh, but the term um, hypnagogic, um, hypno sleep obviously, and agogos or agogos or whatever it's ancient Greek, uh, which means induced. That came in in the 1840s, 1848 actually, um, and that was that's basically what we know as now, which is um, sort of hallucinations that come from sleep as you're falling asleep. Mm. Um, and hypnopompic comes from hypno, sleep, obviously, and pompey, which means, the, which is like sort of sending. Sending. Yeah. So um, it's kind of, um, it's the transition between sleeping and like, uh, sleeping and wakefulness. Yeah. So it's kind of, I, I, I don't really know what it, for, what they mean by that, but hypno, sleep, pompey, the sort of act of sending your says. soul is mm. being sent back to your body sure oh. maybe, maybe it might come, like, it's, it's yeah. gone it's gone back it's come from the real world and gone back into you know you know the well, la, when you're la, asleep la, your soul goes to the real world oh yeah and then when you oh. wake up it comes here yeah this little pretend world that we i'm sorry luke <laughs> hey i'm Not very so grounded really in on. reality now you can't do it don't worry <laughs> i wasn't trying i was making a joke and i was like oh no you have no power here. a year ago that would maybe go <laughs> I have unlocked the secret. <laughs> ha! You tripped. Up. I must leave. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, as you're waking, as you're waking up, hypnopompic um, hallucinations happen. Then, um, and they can be visual. Uh, they can be auditory. Um, they're usually, uh, they're usually one of those two. But they can also, um, they can also like sort of have movement sensations with them as well. Mm. So you guys might have heard of uh, the hypnic jerk. Right. Oh yeah, when you're falling asleep and you're kind of twitching. Yeah, you're twitching. You're <gasps> I get that on the tube when I fall asleep. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, that is hilarious. And you yeah. said it's to do with your body checking if different parts of your body are your brain checking if different parts of your body are asleep. I didn't say that today, but I have said that before. I've okay. heard kind of, I've, I've kind of looked into it more, and there's kind of sort of conflicting things I found. I think that it, that might be one of the theories, one of the reasons. Mm. But um, there's sort of other things. We'll go into it. We'll go into it in just a sec, just to cover, um, just to cover hypnagogic and. Hip Napompic hallucinations first. Uh, thank you to the patrons that uh, that sent this in because <laughs> making us work for our money. Well, those words were very <laughs> fun to read, but saying them out loud <laughs> has been an utter pain. So, um, yeah. So they they happen falling asleep, waking up. Obviously, um, up to one third of people, and it says up to one third of normal individuals, basically excluding people that um. People that have got some kind of psychiatric illness, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, it affects, it, yeah. I, I, this is this is my issue with it. It keeps on saying um, in, in papers I've read and books that I've looked at, they say normal individuals. I really hate that word because it it's not very descriptive. I don't know what a normal individual what is. is. Normal? I assume they mean people that don't have some kind of psychiatric illness that um, results in an increased risk of sort of hallucinations. Mm. You should just say that. Just say that. Instead of it's normal. a bit weird to be like normal people. Yeah, because it, it's difficult. It's like it's the idea that if you're oh if you if you got schizophrenia, you're abnormal. You're weird. Well, that's an interesting one because what is the, I mean, a, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a uh, cishet white man, Luke. That's if that's your question. If your well, question is what is normal, <laughs> cishet able-bodied white man with no mental illness. Sure. <laughs> okay. But what I mean is, is like, can you use? Like, I guess the word normal has a negative, um, a negative correlation. I'm oh, sorry, negative um, <laughs> sort of. Connotation. connotation but also it has also has like a mathematical connotation as well like you have the norm and you have like it's like an average or something like that it, 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 it can have an actual clear definition that is totally a fair assumption to make right yeah i just feel like in this context it's it's not necessarily specific enough no and it's just it does feel a bit sort of judgmental I'll, yeah it feels a little bit careless to you to, mm. i feel like a, a more specific more specificity would be would be better in this case yeah just personally but I, i'm not i'm not before anyone gets up in arms i'm not cancelling the scientists <laughs> i'm not saying that normal isn't a word we should use no but is it is it in a scientific paper it is yeah it was well in, that's unhelpful um, then it wasn't terribly help, terribly helpful. Yeah. No, I, I had to assume that what they meant from normal. You have got to mm. hold yourself to a higher standard if you're writing a scientific That's paper. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Of course you do. So, normal, like you say, might mean like straight people, or like it might mean like yeah. If you're using it as like an average, as like a if you took an average of people, which who is the average, it might could mean anything. Yeah. I mean, I assume it's fairly clear that it's it's referring to individuals that don't have an increased risk of hallucinations already, but it. Mm, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> these hallucinations. 
Um, hypnagogic hallucinations, uh, they it's, it's difficult to kind of sort of estimate how prevalent they are because there's not been a huge number of clinical studies on it. We don't understand fully the clinical significance mm. of it. But um, we've, we've kind of got, I've kind of got some different numbers here. So from 25 to 35% of people um, and hypnopompic hallucinations um, have a prevalence of 7 to 13%. Um, Hypnopompic are coming out of dreams. Yes, yeah, so hypnopompic mm -hmm. coming out of dreams, hypnagogic going into dreams. So going into dreams, twenty-five to thirty-five percent coming out of dreams, seven to thirteen percent. But they're uh, they're all, both of them actually, are more common in younger people. I was going to ask this ah. exact thing. I used to have like hypnopompic hallucinations growing up, where I would wake up from a dream and I'd have like a lightsaber, and I would it would be so clear, and I would be like, I don't know how to keep this because it arrives when I wake up, and then it goes after a few minutes. And it was when I was a child, I had it all the time. I had one the other day in your car, actually. Did where you? I kind of, I woke up and I was like, I thought I was, I think I thought I was on my phone. Um, oh, sure. And then I wasn't, I, I thought I might have been driving in a convertible as well, but then I wasn't. And I woke up and I was just in your car and I was like, oh. To be not. clear, I was driving or Corey wasn't driving. He <laughs> no, wasn't no, having a hypnopompic oh, no, hallucination <laughs> in my car whilst driving it. This was when I'd parked, well, this was when I'd parked your car and yeah. I was sleeping, I was having a nap in your car <laughs> yeah. while it was parked. Yeah. Corey was driving my car, but not at the time of the hallucinations. <laughs> time for a nap. <laughs> I'm on my phone. Oh, I'm actually driving a convertible. Oh, God! <laughs> <laughs> Come to think of it, I actually do wake up a lot thinking I'm holding my phone, and then I look and it's not there, and I'm like, oh, it's quite sad. It is frustrating, yeah. That, yeah. I, I, the, the more I think about this, the more I realize I have these sort of things, and it, yeah. it'll make sense. We, we'll, get to, we'll, we'll get farther through this episode, I think. It's going to reveal a fair bit about us and why the three of us tend to have probably these kinds of hallucinations. Oh. You know what's interesting about the thing you said about the category of normal people, <laughs> yeah. right? Well, if 13% of pe normal people have hypnopompic hallucinations, and about 30% of normal people have hypnagogic hallucinations, then those people aren't normal people. The normal people are the people who don't have those hallucinations at well, all. I mean, but are they or aren't they? Because well, yeah. Sure. What is what is this is this is the thing we don't. Oh God, that's why normal is such an awful. Way. This is <laughs> my science teachers growing up have ruined me. I can't use the word. Oh, what is it? Um, amount. Every every single time I try and use the word amount, my brain is like, don't do that. Because whenever we were in science, they said you can't say amount. You've got to say volume or uh, area uh, or what. You've got to be specific. Right. So the word amount in my head, I, you'll probably notice. I, I I very rarely use it, or I hesitate before using it. Mm -hmm. Um. And normal is a word like that as well, where I just, it's not specific enough to be used. You, you need to be clear about what you mean by normal, or, you know, you need to highlight it somewhere else in the paper. But I, this, oh gosh, what does normal mean? Especially when you're talking about something weird that's going on with the population. And you're a scientist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with exactly. Like, you have a bit of a burden of like specificity on you there. Yeah, I mean, like, what, why are, why are articles and papers and studies, blah, 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 all that so long and full of so many big words that I need to look up if they're not being specific? Mm -hmm. I've wasted so much of my time just pressing, like, pressing down on my, uh, on my phone or on my keyboard just to <laughs> highlight the definition of a word, see what it means. Not the word normal. Look up. No, not the word normal. <laughs> <laughs> not the word normal. What does <laughs> you that can, mean? You can't find out what that means. It just mm -hmm. means whatever. It doesn't come up with a definition. Yeah. Normal. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's quite abnormal. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So what, what kind of things do you think, uh, we've already kind of touched, that, touched on this, but what kind of things do you think would increase your sort of not risk or the, the likelihood of having um, these kinds of hallucinations? Sorry, per, for like for an individual or for any individual, what would make it more likely that any individual would have them? Yes, sure. Sleep deprivation. Um, ah. It's not there, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I do. I do know off that it's not in that list that I've got here, but it is. Yeah. I do know. I do know. Yes, from elsewhere. Yes, yeah, sleep deprivation or like poor sleep hygiene. Yeah, sleeping um, in a new place. It doesn't say that there. No, um, I've got current drug use, um, mood disorders, anxiety, and past alcohol use. So these ah. these things can kind of um, these things can kind of increase your risk of. Very interesting that alcohol use can have an effect on whether you have hallucinations because well, that's seen as such a like safe drug so, by yeah, our a, society that doesn't mess with your mind at all. It just alcohol, messes with your liver. Yeah, sure. I mean, alcohol is very much a safe drug. Uh, very much a safe drug, uh, probably because of the amount of uh, ching it brings in. Yeah, you know. True. Ah, you yeah. Think. You is, that what it, is that what it's for? Who's oh. why? <laughs> <laughs> for a for a split second there, Luke was Luke was so convinced. Uh, you think it's because oh. it doesn't have any effect on capitalism, Corey? 
I, is that what you think? I put, someone asked me, how would you, like, what, what, what one problem in the world would you want to solve? Like, if you could solve only one of the world's problems. I said capitalism. And someone responded to me saying, why would you solve it if you could just get rid of it? Like, getting rid of it would, would solve it. <laughs> that would solve the problem. Uh, I want to solve climate change. Why, don't you, why wouldn't you just get rid of it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, I mean, it's like killing two birds with one sco- with one stone. With right? one scone. Yeah, killing two yeah. birds with one scone. Fuck you, Peter. Um, so. Don't feed scones to birds. <laughs> it's very easy to feed two birds with one scone. Birds are very right. small. More than two, probably. You can feed many birds. With we should one start scone. using scones I instead of stones. I mean, I, I feel like if you're could, trying to, f- yeah, it could be an emu. That's probably just one. That's <laughs> yeah, a one scone. Well, no, you just break it in half and chuck it at one emu and then chuck it at the other one. Is it stale? Is it going to bludgeon them? Okay, so, Jamp, you try and kill. You try and kill two birds. No, I no, I would I would okay. never mess with an emu. Never. You try and kill two birds with one stone, and I'll try and feed two with one scone, and we'll see who comes out on top. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. I mean, not okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we each get to pick the other person's bird. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Jamp's going to pick an emu for you. Emu. Well, I'm going to pick a cassowary. Which is like an emu, but sharper. I don't know what that is. <laughs> you don't want to look it up. Okay. It, it, it is worse. It's like a dinosaur. Oh. Yeah. Oh. This is what happens when you try and have a fight with a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I looked up oh. weird animals when I was a kid. I can beat oh. you in this. He's definitely oh. the weird animal kid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was a little yeah. boy. <laughs> I was a reptile kid. A yeah. little reptile boy. So we're talking about... Uh, the things that can sort of increase your risk of having these hallucinations mm. when you're falling asleep and waking up. Drug use, mood disorders, anxiety, past alcohol use. Alcohol affects your sleep as well. Mm-hmm. Right? You, we were talking about alcohol being a sort of, oh, seemingly harmless drug. But it, it's, it's not great. It, you don't necessarily sleep very well on alcohol. That's why even if you sleep like sort of 12 hours after a night out, even if you don't have that bad hangover, you wake up, you do not feel rested at all. Yeah, it gives you an inflammation, doesn't it? Yeah, you're chucking poison in your body, aren't yeah. you? Stuck in yeah. poison, and your your body's like, well, look, I can digest this poison, so cool, but also it's gonna be messed up for a little bit, you yeah. know. Be I'm gonna up. take my damn time. <laughs> exactly, digesting this poison. <laughs> so, uh, there's also it, it it they're not uncommon. This is the thing; they're not uncommon, um, but they are more common in people with narcolepsy um, or other kinds of sort of mm. other some some other sleep disorders. I would say they're not normal people. People with narcolepsy. Yeah. Oh, Not wow. everyone has narcolepsy. Most of them don't. It's terribly narcophobic of you. Coming out with the hot takes today. I <laughs> hey, man. So hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations, they can happen, um, they can last, you know, seconds, minutes. Uh, they're, they're variable, is essentially, is, is essentially what I'm saying. Why are words so hard right now? Uh, but they could be anything. They could be sort of lines, patterns. They could be people. I remember once I had a hallucination of groundskeeper Willie. Just right, it's just his head next to my bed when I was a kid. And I was like, I swear I saw it. And I wasn't sleeping. Must have been one of those. That's horrifying. That is horrifying. so freaky. Did he yeah. scream at you? It was probably because of the Treehouse of Horror episode where um, he does Nightmare on Elm Street and um, kills all of the children. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it was terrifying. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I really shouldn't have been watching this as a kid. So it could be complex. It could be humans, animals, all, all these different things. It could have sounds. It can... It can have lots of different uh, sort of parts to it, um, and people. This every single thing I've read says, oh, you can have a neutral response, or some people can be scared, or some people can find them quite pleasant." Basically, it just means nothing, really. <laughs> all the options. Who? All uh, yeah. <laughs> I suppose you could find them like sexy. I suppose that would be a positive thing, unless you didn't want it, in which case it's a negative experience. Or, but it's a different it's, dimension than good and bad. Perhaps it's just yeah. neutral. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. That's you're you're right, Luke. You've got the good back bad axis, and you've got the sexy not sexy <laughs> axis. Yeah. <laughs> the only two dimensions. <laughs> I started my career in the sex not sexy axis, mm-hmm. but the good axis. <laughs> good but not sexy. <laughs> and now you're sexy but not good. Oh. oh. You I can be, good. be sexy and good. <laughs> well, you're asking for quite a lot there, Luke, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> what? You... <laughs> I'll keep praying. <laughs> <laughs> you're just good because praying is very sexy, isn't it? Pretty sexy. I'm pretty good. I'm getting on both knees. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, um, it was first described in 1846. So we've known about these sort of things for a while. We still don't really know exactly what causes them or exactly how they happen. Um, we've spoken about hypnic jerks, which is not necessarily the exact same thing, um, but they are more common in children as well. Um, and they, those are the kind of things that as you're kind of falling asleep, they can wake you up. Your body kind of just sending little um, sort of signals 
um, to your limbs and, and whatnot to make sure everything's okay and all mm. of that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, basically what's happening with hypnic jerks is it's two different parts of your brain sort of battling it out to uh, essentially um, have power. So when you're asleep, one part of your brain is sort of more dominant and doing all the sleep stuff. Mm -hmm. When you're awake, there's another part of your brain sending signals and doing other stuff. That's basically hypnic jerk. We could do another another episode on those. They're not super related to these um, these hallucinations, or at least I'm fairly sure they're not the sort of the exact same thing. But you know, they're they're sort they're sort of similar. Um, and we don't really know what causes these hallucinations. Like I've said, uh, it's it's difficult. They're similar to daytime hallucinations, sort of neurologically, but they're also similar to dreams, um, mm. which makes sense because it's in that sort of transitional state between waking and sleeping, or sleeping and waking. Uh, so we're still working on it. Um, and I, I mean, I've read a paper that, that said, ah, oh, well, there's, there's differences between, you know, sleeping, REM sleep and these hallucinations. So it seems that it's more similar to daytime hallucinations, but I've seen other stuff, uh, different things saying different, uh, different places saying different things. So it, I, I don't have a solid answer for you, unfortunately. Oh. Um, but, you know, uh, science doesn't really have a solid answer for you. I read a really interesting thing. Um, I think it was either a scientific paper or a report on a scientific paper that was talking about why we dream, uh, because we still don't really know. Yeah. Um, and this, this one was really interesting. It's kind of relevant to what you're saying there. One of the things it was saying was basically that the brain, in some ways, rewires incredibly quickly. Um, and that if you were to spend the in, one of this theory goes that if you were to spend the entire night with literally zero visual stimuli because you've got your eyes closed, then parts of your brain would start to rewire away from the visual cortex or from the um, signals coming from your eyes. Um, and so, in order to combat this, um, what the visual cortex or what the part that brings the eye the data's in for the eye, whatever, whatever it is, sends out random signals in order to keep signals going down those pathways in the brain um, so that it doesn't get wired out of existence. Ah. I have heard that, and I'm pretty sure we've had a conversation about this before, or Perhaps. I've read the same thing, or you've said it before. I have heard that. I don't know how, I don't know how much water that theory holds. I think mm. it's interesting. I like listening to the sort of theories that people have um, about why we dream, because mm. they're always very interesting. You know, There's the one that, that kind of goes that we use it to sort of consolidate memory, Mm -hmm. I think we did that in our yeah. so we did we did the science of dreams episode didn't we yeah. I think we spoke about that so there's an idea for it it's it's to consolidate memory and to sort of process what happened during the day which is why you can have sort of stress dreams and things like that yeah I, I mean and the brain does rewire fairly quickly I don't know if it's fast it's so fast that eight hours um, of visual inactivity would be enough to do that well did, I guess it's just that every other sense is continuing to receive data like you're you're still going to get like the touch of your sheets, you're still going to get sounds coming in through your ears, but you've got literal like black and static Fair enough, from yeah. your eyes. Yeah, and generally, um, it's usually quite quiet as well, mm. which is why, yeah, I mean, I suppose like you, you do have all of that sort of going on in dreams. It is interesting though, isn't it? Because you'd think that... Oh, sorry, so the added thing to that is that our, we as animals um, are so heavily, we have such a large portion of our brain dedicated to sight. So like ears and touch and stuff, they're kind of secondary senses. Um, for most people, mm. whereas you're, you've got such a large portion of your brain dedicated to visual. Yeah, I had a, almost an argument on TikTok about this the other day, because no, how did you have an argument on TikTok? In my in my that? comments, in my comments, um, in no in that. So what I've started doing with my TikTok, which I quite like, it's from stuff that we talk we talked about in the podcast, wherein we talk about something and it's a good idea for some kind of sci-fi story or some kind of element to use in, in a piece of sci-fi, mm. and I said, hey, you know. Every single time we watch a, a film or read a sci-fi book or whatever, humans always have fewer senses or weaker senses than whatever thing they're fighting. Mm. But I think it'd be really interesting for something else to have fewer or less senses than humans and for that to give them um, some sort of advantage. You know, a quiet, a quiet place. Well, people kept on saying a quiet place. I, right. I think my key point was it was fewer and or well, sort of fewer and weaker senses. So a right. quiet place is a case oh, of they've like, got enhanced hearing. They've got such good hearing that they don't need to see, and it's not really being blind. A doesn't, yeah, yeah, right. So it, it's not it's not a thing. Yeah. If I, I said it'd be really cool, and it was specifically about a quiet place because someone said a oh, quiet place falls into this, and I was like, yeah, they don't need to see because they're hearing they so can hear good. Everything. What if they had? What if they had sort of hearing on par with humans and then they realized oh if we have like these really if we use like these really flashy lights it like humans can't humans can't see 
and mm. we can and it doesn't affect us at all but we can we can stop them that way yeah or you know they don't have a sense of smell and so you use chemical weapons that make really bad smells and then it affects people when they're fighting them yeah. or if they can't hear and they use loud you use sort of loud noises things like that right and someone said oh but if if these aliens evolved they wouldn't be able to evolve without sight and i was like you don't, no you don't know that this is an this is a fictional alien world that we're making up and they said no no it's following the process of evolution it's a very something, sight-centered opinion yeah it? something <laughs> couldn't have like something i'm trying to take this seriously something couldn't evolve without sight and i'm like are you joking me things could absolutely evolve there could be a planet with less light you could absolutely evolve without sight and the reason that you think that something can't is because sight is such a dominant sense yeah. for you yeah. that you feel reliant on it but yeah. there's an alien sat on another planet with another sense that we couldn't comprehend going Life can't evolve without this sense. And exactly. we're just like being able to see light that we can't see. Yeah, they exactly. Can see heat. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can feel, we can sort of feel heat. Well, we can feel temperature changes based on blah, blah, blah in our skin. But um, we can feel heat, but we can't see infrared. We can't yeah. see different wavelengths of light. It, it, you know, we, you can definitely, I feel like you could definitely get by with that sight. And there are other senses that could absolutely take over. But you don't, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it, we don't conceptualize that because we're stuck in our own sort of like little case of perception. I hope you know that the story you're describing mm -hmm. about a battle between humans and an animal with less with less senses mm -hmm. is the end of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. That's not the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> an animal slowly losing. Look, it's a giant That's, snake. Yeah. <laughs> it's a giant snake being controlled by see, a dead wizard ghost. It can no longer smell. <laughs> it's being controlled by a dead wizard ghost. Yes. And also it can hear, it's just... Hey, look. it's a very powerful alien it's a snake creature. That if it bites, it's because it's wounded, isn't it? That's why I can't yeah, say Yeah, because it. he stabbed it. And he, yeah. and he, look, it's a snake that can, if you bite, if it bites you, you're basically dead. The only yeah. reason Harry gets out is because Dumbledore has like a bloody magic bird that fixes all of the problems. In yeah. Oh, phoenixes, not only can they their tears heal everything, they can also fly you out of the Chamber of Secrets, Harry, because that's just <laughs> what phoenixes can do. That doesn't make any sense. Why did she write that? Is that not what phoenixes can do in the real world? No. I just I just think it's a bit it's a bit convenient that. that they're stuck in the chamber of secrets and phoenixes one of their abilities is being able to carry heavy loads. Yeah. It's just it's a bit convenient. Yeah. There's there are many other ways they could have that gotten out of there. That does feel like you've got to page 300 and you've been like how do I, I, know, I need right. to finish this oh yeah book. I locked them in the, the chamber of secrets how are they going to get uh, out oh yeah. well the phoenix is already here to save Harry's life I guess it can do that. Like, how how does how does Tom Riddle in his day get out does the basilisk like does he like ride the basilisk up to the top no because the, the only reason they couldn't get out uh, was because they blew up the walls yeah yeah but how do they get out because like it's like a slide isn't it uh slytherin would have built a ladder maybe mm. Mm. or just magic themselves like it's true I mean, yeah. guardian leviosa i don't know they're wizards bring a broom with you yeah many ways yeah 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 okay or bring a phoenix with you <laughs> well the phoenix comes down every time <laughs> so another one's down there. <laughs> well, you need the phoenix in case you get bitten by the basilisk, right? Like you'd want to have one nearby. Thank God the phoenix never dies. Oh <laughs> <laughs> I used to think those books had like great world building and 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 and, and, and real like they were really really well written. But like looking back, they were it's a great world. It's a lot of fun, but it feels like a lot of stuff was just made up on the spot to solve a problem <laughs> that like was too difficult to fix otherwise. So back to hallucinations. Um, I've just got some. I've just got some sort of uh, papers. Papers that I looked at. Yeah. Uh, that I th found interesting. So uh, there was this one that said that fragmented sleep, and this is what I was talking about earlier. That uh, the fact that the three of us seem to have um, a sort of high, a fairly high level of um, these kinds of hallucinations, hypnagog hy hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations, um, probably indicates that we're not very good at sleeping. Because this study finds out that found out that people with um, sleeping problems, people with poor sleep hygiene, tend to have higher rates of these hallucinations. So people with um, fragmented sleep, as in they would wake up regularly throughout the night, tend to have a hypnagogic. You just. I'm sorry. I've got awful sleep. <laughs> yeah, I can, you must do. You I must edit. Do. I edit during the evening, and then I go to bed probably later than I should, and then I get up at four for my job, four in the morning. So it's quite bad sleep. That's not really good at all. No. That's really not good. No. I'll get out of it one day. Yeah, I have no sleep schedule. I sleep when I feel like, or I force myself to stay awake until mm. I can't oh. anymore. Oh, that's not good. Well, it's because I, I got stuff to do. I was going to say, sleeping when you feel like it sounds healthy. 
Yeah, if it, you it, need to. Yeah, but sometimes I feel like sleeping a lot, and other times I feel like I need to do everything all at once. Mm. You know, so how is your sleep? That sleep's great, man. Yeah, that one the horrible uh, sleep paralysis episode I told you about, where this demon was coming to attack Rebecca, my partner. Mm-hmm. That was when I moved into a new house. So, like, obviously, I'm feeling a little bit funny. But other than that, mm. yeah, I sleep. Well, I sleep great. It's pretty good. It's lucky you're not moving into a new house anytime soon. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> the demon's back. <laughs> it's found you. Knock no. knock. <clears throat> no, so it's interesting though, because um I mean I think when my sleep was much worse. Yeah. I used to get sleep paralysis, all of these different things way more often. But the idea is essentially that um yeah, so fragmented sleep, waking up sort of regularly throughout the night, um, relates to sort of a higher occurrence of hallucinations. Um and it's the case for hallucinations, um, like auditory, visual, olfactory, and tactile, basically all of the senses essentially is what they're saying. But what's interesting about that is that it shows that it um it's it's not it's not just it, it suggests that um these hallucinations aren't related just to REM sleep because REM sleep doesn't tend to have sort of um olfactory, sort of smelling hallucinations, mm. you know, along with it. Yeah. You don't usually No, you don't smell like pizza in your dreams. No, exactly. And you don't usually sort of feel things necessarily in your dreams no, in the same way that you do when you're awake, right? Never. Exactly. So that study is kind of saying, oh, well, maybe it's less to do with REM sleep and more to do with sort of the same way that waking hallucinations happen. Um, and yeah, essentially what they're saying is if you've got these kinds of hallucinations, there's no treatment for it. Uh, some people on certain um, antidepressants or um, other, I think, I think beta blockers um, will, will will sort of have an increased um, sort of incidence of that. Mm. Uh, but really, just have better sleep hygiene. Just go to sleep at a certain time. Wake up. It's the silver bullet. Yeah, it there is. It's it, Just be healthier. If you want to not have problems, just be healthier. <laughs> There's no way that's the answer. No, seriously. It, 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 like, actually, it's, it's really frustrating because it's like going yeah. to the gym and feeling and, and feeling good. Like, it's it sucks to try and it sucks to try and exercise when you're not feeling good. Yeah. But once you get into a pattern of it, it just, you feel better. Yeah. It sucks. It's mm. really annoying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to feel better, you got to feel good or good enough to feel better, you know? Yeah, it's like one of those things where, um, as you, like, as you, it's like when you when things are getting worse, everything else gets worse. Mm. And that, it's like a feedback loop. And when things are getting better, everything else gets better. So if you're in a good place, you're also going to sleep better, which means you're going to be in a better mood again, mm-hmm. on top of the better mood you were already in, and you're going to sleep better, even better again, and you're going to do your work better and be more efficient, and then yeah. you'll get to bed at a good time, and then if other way. Things will just get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah, until you stop. And it takes that little bit of extra cycle. effort. Yeah, to yeah. break the cycle. Uh, but moving on from that, uh, there's another one that I thought you guys might, be, I thought you guys might find interesting. Mm. Lucid dreams. So this uh, looked at um, using hypnopompic hallucinations to induce lucid dreaming. Um, and in fact, apparently it's quite an effective method. So it's based on... Um, I mean, so this was um, this was tested on uh, people at commercial events over 12 years. Um, and it was it used hundreds of people. And the main idea of it is basically using a hypnopompic hallucination to sort of induce lucid dreaming uh, by sort of starting a plot, essentially. And then it feels kind of like an out, the, the hallucination kind of feels like an out-of-body experience. And then mm. that can somehow transition into lucid dreaming. Um, and uh, so they looked at this. It's, it's based on, um, or it kind of came from a Tibetan dream yoga tradition. And it's been really heavily changed over the years. Um, and they took data from uh, just under 450 people, 449 people, mostly people who had tried it for the first time. Um, and they tried it over the course of two nights. And apparently 484 attempts were successful. So if you want to try and lucid dream, maybe look into that. I think it's quite interesting. Hmm. Which scientist was it that used to, I, I guess is possibly related to hypnopompic dreams or hypno, no, actually hypnagogic dreams. There was a scientist who created a device where he sat and he would just as he was falling asleep the device would like ring a bell or do something to wake him up and then he'd write down the thing he was just thinking of because that that sort of sleep wake state was particularly good for creativity um ah. i actually have that in my next little bit ah. was it galileo uh, well i don't i not only was it, maybe it was galileo i don't know this so this is from um this is from i think a book called Altered and Transitional States. Uh, but this is a section called Creativity and Hypnagogia and Hypnopompia. Um, it might have been Thomas Edison. 
so think it was. Thomas Edison, it says here, Thomas Edison often stretched out on his workshop couch. During these half-waking episodes, he claimed he was flooded by creative images. But Salvador Dali also did it. Um, mm. uh, apparently, Beethoven um, used it, uh, used um, these sort of hallucinations for inspiration. Um, Mary Shelley apparently said that Frankenstein came to her as a series of hypnagogic images the evening after her group of friends agreed to compete for the best original gothic horror tale, and she won. Starting science fiction. Oh, wow. Yeah, go her, right? Um, and uh, lots of lots of different people apparently um, used these, uh, what, used hypnagogic hallucinations or hypnopompic hallucinations for creative inspiration. And it makes sense though, right? Because I feel like if, you, if you're in that kind of state of um, almost free hallucination, mm. if you've got an idea kind of sitting in the back of your brain, it sometimes does feel like it can just pull it out, yeah. you know? You can visualize, especially if you're not someone that can usually visualize stuff do you know mm. what happens to the state of your brain in that like in that transitional state because i know that you have like this might be a reduction like reductive way of talking about it but i know that there are like different wave patterns between waking and sleeping like you have alpha beta gamma waves and a few others which mm -hmm. are like um like some of them are meditation ones, some of them are sleep ones some of them are alertedness some of them are flow do you know of anything to do as like what the brain is doing in that tr transitional state that may make like you more creative, for example. I've, I honestly, I'm not really sure. Um, it's there's there are there's a lot of people talking about talking about these hallucinations, but the actual sort of I feel like the actual sort of studies into the specifics of it just there weren't that many that I could find that mm. um, were easy enough to parse. So I'm not really sure. To be honest, where where that sort of creative, like where what what the sort of um, what's going on in the brain to make it more creative? So interesting because it seems like such low hanging fruit in terms of if so many like famous and successful scientists mm. and creatives etc have like extolled the benefits of um, this sort of transitional state, you'd think science would want to figure out how to sort of induce it or how to hone that um, because people come up with like interesting scientific ideas in those states. Mm -hmm. And like, there's a lot of talk I've seen like about people who, I don't know if this is necessarily accurate, but um, supposedly, at least in some sort of scientific breakthroughs, there's this sort of um, the realization, like you've, you've done like a bunch of work and you've got it all in your mind. And then suddenly you, you have like a eureka moment. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a lot of work that goes to that eureka moment, but your brain puts together two things, three things, five different things, and then suddenly something makes sense. Yeah. And you go, oh my gosh. And we might not necessarily understand how that works. Mm. Uh, and you think that studying that kind of thing, like where you can get your brain into an altered state where it makes connections it wouldn't otherwise have made, would be pretty desirable. I mean, th there likely are studies on I just have yeah, not yeah. had time to parse. So what I could do is I could definitely go away and look at that and we could do another episode on on specifically yeah. this in regards to creativity. Yeah, I mean, even if there are scientific studies into it, which mm. I'm sure there yeah. are out there, it's not something that is like, like the average person on the street wouldn't, for example, know the fact that a bunch of creatives use the sleep-wake, like the, the transitional state yeah. to come up with ideas. Because I suppose the idea of messing and playing with your own conscious states is not a particularly um, common one. I think there are other ways of coming up with ideas. I think that's that. That's the thing. I think that it's not necessarily the best way of coming up with ideas. It's just what a lot of kind of eccentric people did. Mm. And whether it actually was the was the true source of their creativity or whether they could have come up with it anyway. I mean, that, that sort of, that remains to be seen really. Mm. But I've, I mean, personally, if I'm going to take a sort of le like, um, I'm not a neuroscientist. I don't know specifically how brains work, you know. Mm. But if I'm going to take a look at it um, and try and work through it logically, I would say that it kind of makes sense that in that sort of sleep, like that transitional state from sleeping and waking, it is a good it's a good place to have that sort of eureka moment because you're almost sort of free of the distractions that you'd usually have, you know. Right. And you're you've got all of the sort of stuff that your brain has been mulling over for a while and. We've had this. We've had this conversation before. That your brain, like your brain, can very easily have come up with an idea before you're consciously aware of it. Yeah. We, I mean, we, oh gosh, that book. That, it's trying desperately to get it through to you. <laughs> and there, yeah, but there's so much. There's there, there's so much going on under the surface yeah. of your brain that you're not in control of. That you don't. You're not aware of. Your brain mm. hides a lot of stuff that's going on from you. Yeah. Um. And so maybe it's just that 
when there's less noise, it's easier for that idea to push through. Yeah, know? it reminds me almost, there's two things here. It reminds me almost of um, what we were talking about. This, I think it was the signs of orgasms, um, where you were talking about how when you're um, having sex, a portion of your brain sort of shuts down. The prefrontal cortex sort of shuts down. Um, and sort of gets out the way. Mm -hmm. And that if you then have trouble with that, it's because, or it might be caused by the fact that your prefrontal cortex is not shutting down. You're not disengaging in the correct way. I think there was some discussion of that, but Maybe, don't yeah. take that as fact at all. Go and watch the orgasm, the Science of Orgasms episode to find out. Yeah, I think it, I'm pretty sure it was that episode. Do you remember? It would have been that episode. It would have been, yeah. That okay. Right. Um, and that sort of, so then the, the extension of that is that you, if you're saying that it's possible that, although you're not a neuroscientist, as you say, it's possible that that state is a really good way for some idea that your brain has, has sort of naturally computed in the background to pass that through to your conscious mind. Mm. It would be interesting to know what, like, which parts of your brain are shutting down in order to for you to access that state. I suppose, yeah. I mean, we do know we don't know what happens between sort of sleeping and waking, right? We're we're aware of what what processors processors are going on. Like I said earlier, that with the hypnic jerk, it's kind of two parts of your brain mm. that are sort of wrestling for control really. yes and so it could it could just be a case of it being similar those part those parts of the brain mm -hmm. that are like they're fighting it out yeah you know? on that on that i have a really interesting um had a really interesting experience a few <coughs> years ago which was that i used to be in a very good um schedule with making youtube videos mm -hmm. right I, I would make a lot of youtube videos and then when i when it came time i've got to film a youtube video my brain would have just been observing the week I've just had and would just pass me an idea when I when it was oh. time. It was really interesting. And I started noticing this thing because it was like I wasn't having to think of something mm. and I didn't notice the idea come up. I just went, oh, great, got it. Mm. And it was just, I, I guess my brain, if, if we were to anthropomorphize it or make it look like a like or computerize mm -hmm. it, like, like is there a word for computerized? Like to treat the brain like a computer was observing the world. Um, running a little process that goes, right, we'll have to do that at some point, spots an idea and goes, right, we'll log that. And mm. when he wants to access it, it's there. Yeah. And that's really cool that if you, I suppose that's about schedule as well. It's about consistency and, and your brain getting used to the fact that I'm going to have to do this, so I may as well just do it up front. Routine as well. As yeah. Again. Yeah, I think it's, your brain's very good at, gosh, this is, we're going <laughs> to, I'm going to bring up driving your car the other day because it, it's brought up a lot of this sort of stuff for me. Mm. Your brain is very good at, like ignoring what you're doing. So when you're driving, if you're yeah. if you've been driving for a while, you don't pay attention to driving. Like when I when I'm driving, like I'm paying attention to the road, I'm paying attention to stuff. But when I when I I, I was driving the other day in your car, and I, uh, for a second I realized that there's so much to pay attention to when you're driving, and that screwed me. Because then I was like, had this conversation with Jem on the way here. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, now I need to check the mirrors, and I was like, oh, can you check the mirrors? I need to look at the road. Okay, look at the speed, and I, oh, this is too much to do. How am I? And I was like. I was so stressed out driving for about five minutes before I forgot about all of that stuff and I just yeah. kept on driving. And on top of that, look, your car is an automatic. Yes. I'm used to driving manual. Oh, uh, you're reaching for the clutch. My foot was hitting the clutch. Yeah, my hitting, foot was hitting it. it wasn't my foot was hitting there, the brake. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hit the brake a couple of times being like, oh, that was the clutch. Yeah. And it was only when I was just driving and not thinking about it. It was yeah. when I was, when I was like focused on what I was doing, it was fine. But as soon as I got into a flow, that's when I started to have trouble because it's just very different. Yeah, you know? after a little bit, you just adapt to the new the new way of doing things. Yeah, and yeah. so your brain probably got used to just yeah. observing the week and then yeah. coming up with an idea. It's funny because it makes you realize how, like when you're saying, if you decide I, whatever you mean by I, have to consciously do all these things, like, okay, I'm, I am now checking my mirror. I am now checking the wing mirror. I now need to mm. look at my speed. All that stuff. You, the thing you call I, is not actually particularly good at stuff. Your brain is really good at yeah. stuff. I was so bad. <laughs> what's, what's annoying is I was so bad at it because I was spending so much energy and attention focusing on when to switch between each task <laughs> that I knew that I was not taking in enough information yeah. from each like sort of input. So I was whenever I was looking at the sort of wing mirror, I was like, I know that I'm not taking enough information from this wing mirror. There are cars there. Are they close? I'm not really sure. <laughs> okay, and now it's time to look at the speed. What is this the right speed? What is the speed limit on this road? I can't. Well, okay, is there cars in front of me? Is there cars behind? It just it was it was it was an information overload. It was too much, and it. It's shocking that that happened while I was driving and yeah. everyone was safe. But like, yeah. yeah, like driving is one of those things where it's just such a massive information input. And also, 
the car becomes an extension of your body. Mm. I was I was driving the car and I'm like, okay, yeah, I know where the car is. Like, you know, I can I don't even need to really look to see where the lane is. I can just feel where the rest of the car is because mm -hmm. it's just an extension of my body. Mm -hmm. When I turn the it's wheel freaky. like this, the car just does it. It's yeah. like when I you know, move my legs, my body moves. You start doing the overcorrecting when you change lanes like automatically because you just it just becomes instinct. I don't need to Especially think with that. manual as well. There's so many like specific timings between putting down the clutch and changing gear and then, you know, lifting the clutch as you as you accelerate. To, yeah. like, it's like that very specific things that you just get used to and you do Which automatically. I I had forgotten about um like the only the only time I'd experienced that was when I learned to mm. drive. And then the other day when yeah. my brake kept on doing it, I had to stop myself being yeah. like, Oh wow, I'm doing a lot right, automatically. Right. Anyone I'm, listening right now who isn't a driver and hasn't driven it's gonna be like wait so everyone who's driving is not actually driving yeah that's terrifying yeah don't worry it it becomes so normal but you will understand once yeah you start driving. It, it sounds really it's, it's, freaky <laughs> okay think about it this way whenever you walk yeah it's exactly the same are you thinking about i need to put this foot in front of that foot oh i'm i'm losing balance someone's here someone's coming towards someone's... me i need to move out the way yeah, yeah. You know, no yeah. you can walk well i'm not saying never drive on your phone never distract yourself from driving because it's very dangerous yeah. you've got a big metal box yeah. that can hurt people that can hurt and harm and kill people but when you're walking along the street you've got your phone in your hand you, you can look at your phone whilst walking down the street and generally be fine you can avoid people, you can do this and that, because walking is a very simple task that you've been doing for the majority of your life. It's a very complicated task, but your brain's very good at it. Yeah, as, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a very... It's actually it's really complicated. complicated. You're falling and catching yourself. Um, <laughs> Again, with, specific timings with your legs. And exactly, stuff. Yeah. right? Um, and correcting for minor changes in, in the ground oh, and the bumps. bumpy, bumpy roads and... Yeah. Exactly. But you don't think of it. When you're riding a bike, you're not thinking... Pedal, 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 correct, 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 correct. Like, look, look, look. You just run a bike. You're right. It, become, and, it becomes an extension of you. That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and so driving at some point um, just becomes so such an easy thing for you to do mm -hmm. that it's actually harder when you try to focus on every individual <laughs> thing, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. Um yeah, so that's uh, that is generally sort of those those hallucinations, hallucinations, hypnopompic and hypnagogic hallucinations. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about the Tetris effect and um, exploding go. head syndrome. So, oh, here we go. Have you guys heard of the Tetris Fine effect? Tetris. No. I. You have heard of it because I was talking to you about. I, I was talking to you about it earlier today because I experienced it. Uh, I think I literally think that you've. I, I can. It's like on the tip of my brain. If it helps you, Can you give me a hint. I didn't say this to you. I, I, I hadn't seen I hadn't seen you earlier today. I said to you what had happened to me after I, after I was driving your car. I didn't say that it was the Tetris effect, but it but this is the Tetris effect. Oh. Oh. What happened I'll to you today, car? So after I was just talking a lot about driving Luke's car today. <laughs> um, so after I'd driven Luke's car, when I went to bed that night, because I hadn't driven quite a while, mm -hmm. um, and I spent a good few hours driving that day. When I closed my eyes, what do you think I saw? Tetris. I saw the motorway. Ah. What? I saw the motorway. I was on the motorway. It's a Tetris effect where suddenly, like if you play Tetris for a while, you look around the world and you just see Tetris blocks everywhere and you see things that can tessellate everywhere. I get this all it's the similar, time. Yeah, it's, if, it's, yeah. it's yeah. really close to that. So um, it's essentially, yeah, if you, if you, uh, I mean, it's the Tetris is the example that's used. So if you, they've done this with amnesiacs as well. Uh, so if you have people play Tetris for an extended period, um, they will then start to almost sort of hallucinate Tetris. And I mean, I was watching, I think, a SciShow video where Hank Green was like, oh yeah, when, when I do it, I was very confused looking at the computer because the stuff wasn't moving the way it should be in Tetris. Because, but it's, of course, it, it wouldn't be because it's it's a it's a computer screen. Yeah. But yeah, it's basically sort of playing enough Tetris uh, such that you then sort of hallucinate Tetris onto the world that you're like onto the world outside of Tetris. I guess especially when you're falling asleep. I get this with Fortnite. Yeah. Do you? If I play Fortnite <coughs> and I see a pallet of wood, I'm like, right, I'm gonna go smash that. Really? If I play Fortnite and I see a um a single, say for example, a single or a double story building, yeah, I'll hallucinate how many um 45 degree angle um, staircases it will take me to get to the roof mm. it's really freaky it's weird it's I, I didn't know there was a there was a term for this because I get this all the time if I get addicted to an to like an iPhone game like an app oh, I will hallucinate especially if it's a very simple app mm. I'll hallucinate it into like every aspect of my life so one time I got addicted to this game called a bit funny 
balls with a Z. And it's a game where there's like a bunch of like number <coughs> blocks and you have to bounce balls off the blocks to destroy mm-hmm. them. Oh, yes. And then I yeah. found that... That was invented by Steve Wozniak, I think. Was it? Yeah. Oh, I'm pretty oh. sure. Breakout. It was uh, it's probably the original, but there's so many like yeah. knockoffs on, on yeah. the App Store. But I'd, I'd find myself just sat in rooms and imagining, like not consciously, invasively, mm-hmm. I couldn't help it, yeah. imagining balls bouncing off walls and where they would end up. It's very, very freaky. I thought I was the only one. It's no, it's 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 it's, it's a common thing. And yeah. what's interesting is that this this so um this usually happens um when you're falling asleep. Um so the Tetris effect, it it um I, I read a paper about it from two thousand. Um they looked at it when you were falling asleep. Mm-hmm. But also, um and you say intrusive. Yes. Uh, let me read a sentence. That's the scary bit. It isn't it's is very intrusive. Let me read a sentence Similar. here. Participants playing the computer game Tetris reported intrusive, stereotypical visual images of the game at sleep onset. So as you're falling asleep, you start to hallucinate Tetris. Yeah. And I mean, that's what happened when I was starting to, try, starting to fall asleep and I closed my eyes and I just saw the motorway. Because I was like, it, 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 driving on the motorway is like playing a game. Yeah, It is, effectively, it's just a game wherein if you, if you do it wrong, you die yeah. or you get arrested. Um, which is life, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is life, right? Life is a game. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so I was seeing it as I was falling asleep. And what's really interesting about the Tetris effect is that even amnesiacs have mm. the Tetris effect. So even if you can't remember that you played Tetris, <gasps> weird, you'll still like they couldn't say, "Oh, yeah, I was playing Tetris earlier today." They'll still so it's not in the declarative declarative memory. Right? Right. So they're not able to say, "Oh, yes, I was playing this, and I can recall that." But as they're falling asleep, they'll 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 sort of have the um, hallucinations of it. And this is similar as well in that yeah. if you have people sort of practice at Tetris, even if they're amnesiacs, I'm pretty sure. I think I read this in that um, that yellow book that I'll give to one of you today. Um, I can't quite remember the name of it. It's sort of the hidden the hidden. Jump put it on the screen. Put it on the screen. Yeah, it, it was talking about how people can be get better at games even if they're amnesiacs. So you know. Um, your your brain is storing that information outside of the conscious it's like your, of conscious mind. It's like you're training your brain to do. You're, yeah. like you're training to brain, your brain to do a task. Is it is there any kind of correlation between um, the Tetris effect and there being and it being a game that has some kind of like simple underlying geometry? Because Tetris has simple underlying geometry. Fortnite, which I experience it with, has like it's a forty five degree angle mm-hmm. palette. It's quite easy for your brain to work out that as mm-hmm. a like I don't get. Um, like I don't hallucinate. Like oh, I got to shoot that person. Yeah, my game was all about judging angles. Angles, exactly. Yeah, bouncing off walls, and and, and that would make sense if you, if you've got amnesiacs doing it. It's like well, sure, they've forgotten they played it. They've forgotten the fact they played it, but they've trained this aspect of their brain that does mathematical calculations and mm-hmm. works out angles or works out um, mm-hmm. simple math. I think it really only happens with very simple things, or it, or it happens with the simple elements of a complex thing like Fortnite. Like, yeah. 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 Exactly. So I think I, I think it's just training your brain to deal with because your brain is a problem solving machine, yeah. isn't it? Mm-hmm. And you intuitively understand physics, which is why this is this is one of those things where you know, when you play a video game and the physics is off, yes, it just feels wrong. But when yeah. it's right, it feels like cut the rope so clean, on the app yeah. store oh, is flipping feels so clean, yeah. so gorgeous. But also, physics of games is entirely subjective. Do you know a Mario game? How Mario games have a very specific physics to them. Mm-hmm. Mario has a, f- a way that he feels when he jumps and he yep. falls and he lands, yep. mm-hmm. right? And he speeds up in a certain way. And if you've got a knockoff Mario game, I think, or, or I think oh, they, I think so... they ported, I think they ported one of the early Mario games to the to the Switch or to the Nintendo 3DS, and it just doesn't feel right. He moves differently. He moves differently. Yeah. Doesn't work right. It feels wrong. Um, I think even a Sonic game or, or any of these, any of these. Yeah. If I'm playing, I've played Sonic so much. If I'm playing a Sonic game where he doesn't move right. I can't play it. It doesn't feel right because mm. I'm so, you're so used to the physics of that. Yeah. that. It's just, it's off. I love talking about this. This is very off topic, but I love talking about this thing I've re- I realized um, whilst playing, I think probably Mario Kart, which is that, okay, so you have Mario Kart, right? Mario Kart comes out on uh, the SNES in the 1980s mm-hmm. or on the Wii U or on yeah. the Switch or whatever, whatever it is. And you experience Mario Kart, right? As the user interface. And the user interface changes over time. And, you know, Mario Kart Wii or Mario Kart Switch is so mm. much more complex looking and so much more beautiful than sort of Mario Kart SNES, for example. But underlying every game like that, if you imagine Mario Kart, you experience Mario Kart as the user interface, right? This flashy graphic. But the underlying thing of Mario Kart is a bunch of points going round a circuit, mm. 
right? Where they are relative to each other and relative to the circuit and things like how quickly they can accelerate, how, how quickly their turning circle is, um, and what happens when you bump into things and that kind of thing. Mm. All that code, all that math, probably stays pretty much the same across every Mario Kart game, right? Or it's mm. tweaked, but the underlying code, the underlying idea between a racing game on the Switch mm. between a, or a racing game on the SNES mm -hmm. is um, different characters have different physics. They can mm -hmm. accelerate quicker, they brake quicker, they turn corners quicker, mm -hmm. right? It's the same thing. The thing that has fundamentally changed is the flashy thing that makes you go, ooh, it's so pretty yeah. and exciting. Mm -hmm. But the game itself is nothing to do with that. That is like a tiny portion of the game. Then you apply to those points. Well, that point, when you're looking at that point, it has the shape of Mario. And Mario is stored as a shape and a bunch of textures. And it's just so weird to think about because we experience a computer or a game or whatever as the user interface. We don't experience all the underlying math that's going say, on. I was going to say that because if you, you guys have played Call of Duty, right? Yeah. Mm, right. Yeah. So when you play, when you like, think back to trying to remember a play playing Call of Duty with your friends, right? Do you remember holding the controller? Yes. Yeah. Do you remember? Do you remember what you were doing with the controller? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. When I'm playing, when I'm trying to remember playing Call of Duty, I'm not thinking like, yeah, I was doing this, oh, swinging the stick. I was, like I'm doing, just like, yeah, it's like you. I was just like, I yeah. can, I can remember having the controller in my hand, and like, maybe pulling the trigger, but like, I, I can't remember like. You don't, of, you don't have to think about where to reach to do something. Yeah, no, just, no, I'm not thinking. Like, I, I, mean, I can just do it right now. Like, yeah. I could, like, I could play the game without having a game in front of me easily. But my point is, when I'm remembering it, I feel like I'm remembering what I'm seeing on screen. But like, the actions of actually putting it into the controller are not necessarily consistent because I've played it on different consoles as well. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. it's, Ugh. yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> played it on Xbox, uh, at PS3. I've played yeah. it on different things. So it's weird that my brain has this sort of. I mean, same with Pokemon where I've played yes. every single Pokemon game on every single console. <laughs> and my brain doesn't remember each individual controller or console or whatever. It's just the visual information and what I am doing. Yeah. Like, I remember Pokemon more as me walking around and doing it than I do me pressing the D-pad to move the little oh, character around. Yes. Of course, because yeah. you're a right? visual creature. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's just very odd that, like, that's how your brain remembers it, but also you can just pick it up and do it. Yeah. It's very strange. Brains are odd. Well, that was quite the tangent. Yeah, another weird thing about brains is exploding head syndrome. You guys heard of this? Okay. Oh, this is the exploding heads. This okay, is the last one. This cool. is the last one. So it's um, it's described as a benign parasomnia. So you know what parasomnias are. They're sort of basically sleep issues, right? Okay. We've spoken about them before. We spoke about yeah. it during... Um, sleepwalking. Was it sleepwalking? Science of sleepwalking, surely. I thought it was a science or sleep of paralysis. sleep paralysis. That, yeah, right, yeah, science of sleep paralysis. Uh, so we spoke about it then. We probably spoke about it during sleepwalking as well. Because yeah. sleepwalking is a parasomnia. Um, but essentially, it's when you experience a very loud sound um, when you're sort of falling asleep, which leads you to sort of wake up like, oh, wow, right? right. And when there's no sound whatsoever. Um, and it says these events occur during the wake sleep, sleep wake transition period and generally last less than a second. Um, you can also get flashes of light and feel distressed, uh, but apparently there, there's no pain either. And oh, I should point out. Your head doesn't explode. Nothing is wrong with your brain. Oh, thank God. You're just hallucinating. <laughs> if it's not obvious, we're talking about hallucinations today. Yeah. You hallucinate a loud noise and maybe some flashing. And basically every single time I've, I've read about this in different places, they've said, there's no issue with it. And most patients, as soon as they find out that it's not harmful, are generally fine with it. Because the, the, the biggest issue, I think, with uh, exploding head syndrome is if you wake up hearing loud noises and flashing, you think, oh gosh, something's wrong with me. Yeah. Something's really and then you find out from your doctor, hey, you're probably fine. And you're like, oh, cool, okay. Does it hurt? No. So it doesn't hurt in the way that a loud sound would hurt? No, it's just a loud noise. Just startles. Well, I mean, you hallucinate a loud noise, so I don't think it hurts. It can't physically hurt your ears. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so you hallucinate a loud noise and maybe some flashing, and it wakes you up <sighs> while you're kind of falling asleep or as you're kind of waking up. Yeah. So it was first described in 1876 by an American neurologist, um, and it wasn't classed as a sleep disorder until 2005. Uh, but yeah, it's more common in people that, um, again, it's, it's not, I don't think it's been super heavily studied, uh, but it's more um, common in people that have got um, sleep paralysis. Mm. Um, and apparently, almost 37, in one study, almost 37% of people with a history of sleep paralysis reported experiencing um, exploding head syndrome wow. um, symptoms at least once. Um, and it, there's, there's not enough studies on it to know sort of exactly how and why and when it when it happens or it could just be that it's it's a fairly normal thing to happen yeah. and so it'll happen to a fair few people um 
you know, sometimes. And it might just happen to some people quite often. What a dreadful name. Exploding Head Syndrome. I love it. Like Phantom Explosion Syndrome. I love Exploding Head Syndrome. It's fun. It's a fun name. It's a conversation starter when you say to someone, oh, I've got Exploding Head Syndrome. And yeah, but then it's a like, disappointing explanation after that. It's like starting no, with a it's, punchline. it's quite fun. <laughs> Ooh, what's that? Oh, you oh, hallucinate a you just, loud noise? You just hear loud noise. That's boring. Okay. But what else would you call it? Come up with a name. Loud noise syndrome. Like phantom phantom explosion syndrome or phantom noise syndrome or like something that's a bit more specific because exploding head syndrome doesn't tell you anything about... It feels like your head's exploding. Uh, wait, it feels like your head is exploding well, or you like, just have you, a loud if noise. If you hear a loud noise and you see flashing, it's like your head's exploding, right? No, it's like there's an explosion somewhere. My yeah. head's never exploded. I head. wouldn't ex- assume. When's if, the last if, time if you're, there was yeah. an explosion outside and then my whole room flashed, I wouldn't assume my head has exploded. Luke, why don't you ask the person in your film whose head you exploded how it felt, mm. and then we can see how it is, right? Yeah. Once you ask that person, because you don't have. Well, he curious. has got exploding head syndrome. Does he really? In the film. Well, yeah, yeah I, I'd assume so. If I was to correctly use the term <laughs> exploding head syndrome to mean someone whose head explodes. Well, that was a hallucination in the film. Yes, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. not to spoil it, by the way. Sorry. Ah, it's like four yeah. minutes in, don't worry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very yeah, funny, we, we actually. We call it the drowning of Arthur Braxton, but then at the end, his head just explodes. It's, it's a real <laughs> you know, left turn. It's a plot twist. <laughs> and a half. Actually, there's another character in the film whose head explodes, but I'm not going to say who. It's after the first head explosion, there is another one. I just want people to be like waiting for it for the entire <laughs> Imagine film. Imagine you wait a whole film and then you get the credits <laughs> and you're like, did I miss it? Did I miss it? And you have to go back there no, and watch it again. Yeah, yeah you have to watch credit. it again. <laughs> <laughs> so that is Exploding Head Syndrome and that is Hypnopompic and Hypnagogic Hallucinations. Mm. What do you guys think? Not fun. No, but no? I'm glad I have a word for the things I experienced as a child. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, it can, this is the thing. It can be positive, it can be negative, it can be neutral. Really. Yeah, I had lightsabers. Yeah. Very positive. Very positive. Very, yeah. Unless you're a Padawan and um, Ad- Anakin is coming. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just start. glad I've got a name for the Tetris effect now. Right? Yeah. I've, yeah. I've had that so many times. Yeah. I think it's really crazy that uh, th- this this was chosen by the patrons, but also that I had it so vividly mm-hmm. just just the other day and yeah. we're doing this episode. Mm. So I don't, I don't usually get it unless I play, I mean, really, I I get it play a, lot. a lot of Tetris. Yeah. If I've been out on a boat. I get it when I go to sleep that night. Yeah, the feeling of the feeling of being on a boat and also oh, the, yeah. the ocean. I get what you mean. Feel. How often are you out on boats in Australia? Quite a bit. How often are you in Australia? Well, not a lot anymore. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> For the first seventeen years of my life, I was there quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll let that one slide. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's I think it's interesting. Like, because I just want to say when I do play Tetris, my brain is my brain has a Tetris mode apparently that I can tap into after playing about three hours of consecutive Tetris. Ooh. Wherein, yeah, the entire world world becomes Tetris, and must tessellate everything. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta cram things into where they fit so they disappear. Uh, <laughs> but no, that is uh, that is that is the episode for today. Uh, I've I've got a little a little thing, a little thing I want to mention before we oh. finish. Oh, quick fire yeah. quiz! Yeah, quick fire quiz! Oh, dun 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 dun! Hypnopoganic compared edition, Tetris edition. I really hope the question is, what is the name for the two waking and sleeping hallucinations? Give him any Jam ideas. does not have an I- any clue. Change the question. I've actually got a question that I wrote earlier. And Luke, yeah, I looked up the answer and found it. So when I was writing the question, Luke was sitting next to me and asked what the answer was. And I said, I didn't know yet. You don't remember that? Yeah. Oh, you do? Okay, good. You just look very confused. Yeah. Okay. So this is quick for our quiz. So I'm going to ask you one question. One question only between the two of you. The first person to buzz in correctly with the correct answer gets to win. What do they win, Jamp? Nothing. That's right. And yeah. you've also got to finish asking the question before you can buzz in with the correct answer, right? Mm-hmm. Those That's are all correct. the rules. Yeah. Cool. Great. Duke. Duke? Of I love Duke. Remember Duke from Tracy Beaker? I'd never watched Tracy Beaker. Get out. <laughs> Duke was like the absolute daddy of the dumping ground. What about the Dukes of Hazard? Never watched that. <laughs> no. Duke and Lamp. Duke and Lamp. Ah, Duke and Lamp. Ah, I am Lamp. Ship names. <laughs> Lamp and Duke. Um, Jamp, what is your buzzer? Uh, Woohoo! <laughs> Luke, what is your buzzer? Ah! Sorry, I just had a oh. hypnopompic hallucination. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're very good at those. Thank you. <laughs> you secretly Have you been Marianne practicing? Voice? No, I've just done it my whole life. So <laughs> practicing. Yeah, <that's> yeah. Practicing. <laughs> practicing's intentional, isn't it? I mean, yeah. So my question for you today is, 
I need to add to this specifically and correctly. When do you get hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations? Ah. Luke, I think you got there first. You get hypnogogic hallucinations as you are, well, gogic, sorry, I have to be very specific to Corey's pronunciation, mm -hmm. as you are in the state between waking and sleeping. And you get hypnopompic hallucinations as you're in the state between sleeping and waking. That's correct. Ding, 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 that is correct. Hell yeah! Well done, well done Luke. Yeah. Sorry, Jamp. You just a little sorry. bit faster next I'll, time. I'll maybe. marry her a bit quicker next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the show for you today, but we do want to thank some people, some of our lovely patrons who mm. made this oh, episode yes. possible. We do. What do we? Want to thank him? You guys oh, yeah. Yeah. Do, yeah. yeah. You texted us these names. I texted you the names. Great. So we want to start off with thanking River. These are our new patrons for the month, by the way. Oh, yeah. If you want to be thanked next month, just head to our Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash side guys. Sign up and we'll thank you for signing up. What a lovely thing to do. I would like Jam to uh, take this next one. Well, oh, my God. Okay. Thank you to Strast Pelmeni Mene. Mene, yeah. Thank you to Passion Dumplings. You know what I did? I translated that from Russian and also tran uh, transcribed the Russian characters into English to make it easier for whoever ah, it was that's going to say it. Uh, Strast Pelmenia. Uh, Strast uh, Pelmenia. Strast or Passion Dumplings, for sure. Strast Pelmenia. Thank you to Alex Munoz. Thank you to Tia Nguyen. Thank you to Jazza Tallo or Jay's Tallo? I'm not quite sure. Sorry. Thank you, Isabar. Thank you, Georgie Teddy. Thank you to Eleanor Allison. Thank you to Grace Coscran. Thank you to Rosie Tilbrook. Thank you to Gabriella Everett Pulgar. Thank you, Holly Cutts. Thank you to Lucy. Hell yeah. Thank you to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you all. Wow. How lovely. Yeah. Yeah, That's very nice. nice. Great one this week. Yeah. Great, great, great one this month. Good choice, you guys. If you want to vote on episode topics or submit episode topics or even just choose a topic that we have to absolutely do, no questions asked, within reason, you can head to our <laughs> Patreon, patreon.com forward slash sci guys, and sign up to get all of that and potentially more. So I think that's it for today, isn't it? Yep. No, absolutely. Yeah. Nothing else you guys want to add? Not a thing. No. Not, Not a, a thing. nugget. Fantastic. Well, before we go, we would like to thank all of our patrons with a very special thank you to executive producers Vin TZ and Ashley Muller. And also, thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday, and why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys, or you can find and contact us at SciGuysPod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and at SciGuys on TikTok too. Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod. At gmail.com. You can follow me at NotCorey everywhere. You can follow me at Jamkin everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cupforth everywhere. I have been in my pants for this entire time. Goodbye. He what? Has, yeah. yeah, I've been, I've not been wearing see. trousers. You'll see. <laughs>